Avatar is here. He's alive. He exists. The only thing standing between Zuko and a quick trip home was a frightened mob of Water Tribe civilians. Hopefully. A village full of frightened women and children wasn't what he expected to find, but Zuko swore not to let his guard down. The Water Tribe was known for employing sneak attacks. A great number of bloodthirsty warriors could lurk behind any of those frozen structures. The Water Tribe boy charging at him did not count. Zuko dodged the youngster's attack with practice ease, disarming his face-painted attacker and sent him flying into a pile of snow. Prince Zuko wasn't planning on taking any unnecessary risks today. During the last three years, Zuko had taken his crew to hell and back, but he hasn't lost a single man doing it. He didn't plan on getting sloppy this close to the end. Where is he? Zuko demanded. Where is the Avatar? Hushed voices, bewildered eyes, unhelpful silence. This was going nowhere fast. I know you have him. If you tell me where, I will leave your village unharmed. At the end of the day, we all can go home, Zuko mentally added. More silence. Zuko sighed. Screw this. Time to put their mocked innocence to the test. Zuko scanned the crowd for a target. Only one pair of eyes dared look back. Gotcha. The girl was young, probably a few years younger than Zuko. She had dark skin and brown hair in a braid. Her blue eyes were filled with fear, accusation, and hatred. This won't be pleasant. Not that it would deter him. You, Zuko said, and pointed at the girl. Tell me what you know of the Avatar. For a moment, Zuko thought the girl was too afraid to answer, but he was quickly proven wrong. The Avatar is the protector and savior of this world, and when he returns, you and your evil nation will pay for what you've done. Zuko narrowed his eyes. What did she expect to gain by saying that? The girl is simultaneously lying to my face and taking the mole high ground. Typical water tribe. Taking a deep breath before continuing, he proposed the girl with a deal. He had made different variants of the same deal before, however, most always in disguise and never in the presence of his crew. Zuko hadn't told the crew about his unusual gift for the fear of father, or anyone else for that matter, finding out about it. But today he would take his chances. Too much was at stake. Right, Zuko said. You should know that if you're lying, I will know. But if you tell the truth, I will let you and your village go unharmed. Are you sure you don't want to say anything more? Don't threaten my sister, you Fire Nation scum! Zuko dodged the oddly shaped projectile, only to have it smack into the back of his head a moment later. Oh, that does it! The Water Tribe boy's lack of training had so far made him no threat to Zuko's plans. But he didn't lack courage, and Zuko had learned years ago what dangerous combination that could be. Another useless attack and a swift counterattack, Zuko was pretty sure there was no ambush waiting for him in the village. No one but the kid currently sprawled on the ground. For a moment, Zuko felt almost embarrassed. He had been so sure he would end up pushing attackers off left and right that he had ordered his men to crash their ship literally into this ice sheet in the village. In retrospect, it had been a bit of an overkill. Now was no time to make amends, though, so Zuko steamed on. The prince took a step toward the villagers, and as a result, most of the village took a step back. But the girl with her hair loops stood her ground. But the girl with hair loops stood her ground. Her show of defiance only strengthened Zuko's resolve to use his power on this particular villager. I might be a predator, but I don't like preying on the weak. Zuko would get the truth out of her, one way or another. Are you sure you don't want to add anything to your little story? Zuko asked. Everything I said is the truth, the girl answered. People of water don't lie like your people always do. We'll find out soon enough, Zuko thought and made his move. Zuko grabbed the girl by her wrist, and before she had time to struggle out of his grip, he placed his other hand on her forehead, fingers on temple. 
He placed his other hand on her forehead, fingers on temple. The placement of the contact wasn't crucial, but this was how the move had been taught to him, and Zuko would take any help he can get. Although he had done this before, he was by no means a master when it came to using the power of dragons. The procedure was at the same time easy and difficult. Assessing an unsuspected target's torrent of memories was relatively easy. Finding what she was looking for, not so much. The mind did not work with the same logic as speech and storytelling. Things could get messy. I wonder if even dragons found this enjoyable, was the last thing on Zuko's mind before their minds were connected. Fear and confusion. What's happening? An image rose from her memory, a water tribe woman telling her it was going to be alright. Mother. And a Fire Nation soldier. Oh no. I'm not supposed to be here. This is not what I came to see. Focus. The Avatar. Where is the Avatar? No Avatar. But he had seen it. An airbending master gracefully leaping down from the ravaged Fire Nation ship. There. A stranger. A friend. A boy in the iceberg. But where? Gone. Just like Mother. Banished. Alone. Not coming back. Zuko broke the connection and tried to catch his breath, cursing his poor choice of prey. This was too close. Damn. Zuko could almost hear Grandmaster Kurta's voice instructing him. Although some emotional transfer is inevitable, you must always make a clear distinction between your memories and your subjects, or you might give away as much information as you receive. Zuko didn't have time to dwell on old wisdom, though, because an odd whooshing sound was closing in on him. The Avatar was either playing him for a fool or testing him. Zuko had experience of it both, thanks to his sister and father, respectively, but he ran out of patience for either long ago. It turned out that Avatar was a 12 year old child dancing around in orange PJs, but that didn't matter. It didn't change what Zuko had to do. Zuko threw two fire fists at his opponent and took a step back to reevaluate the situation. In spite of his looks, the Avatar was far from harmless. The moment Zuko had been preoccupied with newly gained information, the Avatar had swooped in and tackled him to the ground. After high-fiving what seemed to be the entire village cheering him on, Aang had turned his attention to Zuko and demanded him to leave. Or you're what? Zuko felt like asking. Attack me. A little late for that warning. Zuko had many questions for the Avatar, but his earlier interrogation had already answered most of them. So Zuko went with a simple reply. Nothing says, I don't care what you have to say, like a fireball headed for your face. Zuko had learned that the hard way. The Avatar blocked Zuko's attack by swirling his area staff around. Then he cleared a small gust of wind in the way of his counterattack. He's much more powerful than this. He's not even trying, Zuko thought angrily. After the prince had thought of little else other than this moment for years, the Avatar's attitude hurt more than his half-hearted attacks. When the Avatar noticed Zuko had paused, he stopped, attacking as well. I don't want to fight, but I won't let you hurt anyone, he stated. Zuko wasn't sure how to respond. The ironic part was that if the Avatar hadn't shown up when he did, Zuko had been far from the village by now. Katara's memories had suggested Aang had been banished? And Zuko's idea of banishment, that meant Aang wasn't coming back. Ever. Certainly not welcome back as a hero for the first opportunity, Zuko thought wearily. Zuko could have let Katara and her village go unharmed, too. She hadn't told him anything about being an airbender, but she hadn't known Aang was the Avatar. Katara hadn't lied, and so it wouldn't have been necessary for Zuko to carry out his threat. Not that he would have, in any case, burning down helpless villages wasn't Zuko's idea of a fun way to spend the afternoon. The other things the prince had found out about Katara's past had affected his judgment on the matter. He tried to convince himself. Zuko would have left in a hurry because he had an avatar catch. Running to, not from. Zuko took a deep breath to focus on the here and now. How about you don't fight and I don't hurt anyone? Aang seemed to consider it. He looked at the village and then back at Zuko. If I go with you, will you promise to leave the village alone? The Avatar asked, his tone finally serious. Zuko considered it and found no obvious downsides. He nodded. No, Aang, you can't trust him. 
Katara shouted. Standing next to her, Sokka shook his head and glared at Zuko. The Avatar had, however, made up his mind. Aang told his friends he was going to be alright, and then Zuko's men escorted him on to the ship's deck. Aang had no way of knowing whether he would be okay or not, and the Water Tribe siblings didn't look convinced, but there was nothing Zuko could do to change that. He could tell them that he intended to take the Avatar to his father, alive and unharmed. Katara would take his words as evidence of the opposite. She believed all firebenders are evil, and evil people always lie. What an amazing conviction of someone who has never had an actual conversation with someone from the Fire Nation, or from the Earth Kingdom. Yet she thinks pretty highly of them, all the same. Zuko shook his head. Why should I care what she thinks of me? She doesn't know anything, and sure as hell doesn't know the first thing about me. When Zuko's ship disembarked, thoughts of going home was threatening to steal away his attention, but his focus his mind back on the here and now. A crew member handed Zuko the Avatar's fighting staff. As Zuko measured the object in his hands, he remembered from Katara's memories how the Avatar had boasted to the entire village that he could fly with it, and how he really could. Zuko considered his options. He could burn the staff to ash, he had no intention of letting the Avatar escape from him, but but demotion still seemed the safest choice. Before calling forth his fire, Zuko paused to consider if he might have any other use for the unique relic. It could be made an excellent present for his father, but not as good as the Avatar himself. Why risk it? While Zuko was holding the staff, he noticed the Avatar's expression, waiting, almost worried. This was unexpected. From what Zuko knew of the boy, Aang had many things, but worried wasn't one of them. The Avatar had looked worried only once in Katara's memories, after finding out his entire nation had been wiped out a hundred years ago. Even then, the mood hadn't lasted. The staff is important to him. Very important. The real question was if knowing that changed anything for Zuko. Zuko sighed. Azula would mock him for not taking advantage of his enemy's weak spot, but Zuko decided to keep the staff for now. The Avatar had lost his entire people and was now a prisoner of this nation responsible. Somehow adding to that misery seemed uncalled for. If someone stole Uncle's knife and melted it in front of me, I'd be devastated. And I would make them pay for it later. Zuko ordered his men to take the Avatar of their ship's brig. Meanwhile, he would find a hiding spot for the air staff. Thank you.